Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 255. I'm your host, Derek Moore. And with me this week, uh, Mike, we haven't had you on in a while. It's Mike Puck from Zega Financial. How you doing? Good, Derek. Thanks again for having me. It it has been a while. Probably uh, early part of last year was the last time I was on. And a lot's happened since then in uh, our last conversations. <laughs> no, not, nothing's <laughs> happened. All right. Well, Jay, maybe we'll be back next week. I, I think he will be. But Mike, I'm glad to have you on because you're the guy to talk to on this. I've noticed that uh, I don't know if you saw this. CPI came out. CPI came out about 0.3% month over month. But when you look, uh, you dig into the numbers, and you have firsthand knowledge of this, when you look at contributions to CPI, in fact, you look at core and shelter, there's a little thing of shelt- in shelter. It's called lodging away from home, Mike. That really ran up, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who planned a vacation. Like Prices like tripled at hotels. So now it's month over month. I think it, it's slightly negative, but you're traveling all the time. Like you're out in the road meeting advisors and doing some presentations and, and conferences. Like are, are, I'm, I'm doing kind of a man on the street here, Mike. Are you seeing airfares drop finally? Like is, is, can we believe the data? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I have probably spent about 80 to 100 nights in hotel rooms last year. Uh, so I was on the road quite a bit. I would say that hotel exp- prices are are still up, still pretty high. Uh, I think that that kind of started now because of this demand for everybody going back and going on vacations. I mean, that was the number one thing, right? They they opened the doors with after COVID, and everybody just wanted to travel, so hotels were booked, airports were booked. Um, so hotel prices, I think, are still kind of high. But I would say when it comes to flights specifically, the airports are jammed. I mean. You ask anybody who's been on an airplane recently, the airports are packed, the airplanes are fully booked, um, flights are really busy. I, but I have seen, to your point, I've seen them come down a little bit, right? So if I'm looking for that flight, I live in Miami, if I'm looking to fly over to Denver or uh, you know even Los Angeles, I definitely say prices have dropped a little bit for main class tickets. Um, and even you know if I'm going up to Atlanta or Charlotte or somewhere on the East Coast, Things start are starting to look affordable. Uh, I'm actually headed to Mexico next week for for work and uh, for a conference, and the tickets weren't bad. I'll say main uh, main cabin they've probably come down a little bit. Yeah, they're finally coming down after that rush after COVID. Yeah, I'm, I mean, that, I think we're seeing that in the data, and it's just you know, there's a lot of things shelter as as a whole. So shelter is actually. They don't, they don't look at people's house prices. What they do is they do what's called owner's equivalent rent, which is basically they do surveys. I'm, I'm just going to oversimplify this. And they call people and they say, hey, if you're going to rent out your home that you own, what would you rent it for? And naturally, it's, you know, it's probably related to the mortgage payment, but it's probably you know, somebody down the street or it's actual rents. Shelter is starting to come down. But yeah, I mean- I don't think the Fed did anything. I don't want to talk about the Fed today, actually. But <laughs> I don't think they initially did anything. But all right, I t- let's let's try. I want to talk about Bitcoin, and I'm doing this because Jay's not here. And uh, sure, he. <laughs> not that we can't talk about it with Jay on, but Jay and I are. I'm a little bit of a Bitcoin critic. He's a little more supportive of it. But Mike, I got to tell you, like the ETFs came out. There were some Bitcoin ETFs. They call them spot ETFs, and I guess they're going to hold actual Bitcoin, whatever that means. Uh, this might have been one of the most transparent or obvious, and I don't know what's going to happen with with the price of Bitcoin. Honestly, I don't follow that much, but it ran up in in anticipation of the the ETFs coming out. Kind of the buy the room or sell the news. If you look at a chart at it, and I I know I sent you that uh, towards the bottom there, right after you know it spiked at the open when the Bitcoin ETFs were released, and then it just shot back down. I think it's. I don't know the scaling on this. It's probably down like thirty five hundred dollars or thirty five hundred because uh, it's priced in Bitcoin to the dollar. I don't know. It's like to me, this is a classic buy the rumor, sell the news. I have no idea what Bitcoin's going to do going forward, but it's pretty obvious what people were doing here, right? Well, so this is an interesting story. First of all, this week, and I was actually in our office in West Palm in the in the Zega Financial office, and in you know, we were sitting there, we got the news, I believe it was Wednesday, 
where the CNBC Twitter or X account was hacked, right? So that account was hacked and, and somebody came out and tweeted that it, it did, the Bitcoin ETF had been approved. So that's what happened on Wednesday. If anybody's wondering what happened with the spike in the fall this week with Bitcoin, is that happened Wednesday. The CNBC Twitter, or, or formerly known as Twitter, the new X uh, account was hacked. They said, hey, it's been approved. CNBC had to retract that and come out and say, hey, it actually has not been approved yet. So you saw some volatility there with this hacking situation of the Twitter account. Then you got the approval. I think that was on Thursday, Derek, is what you're talking about. And you saw uh, Bitcoin run up. So, you know, based on the price now, 3,500 bucks, 4,000 bucks, right? That's a 10% move. Um, but you're right. That was already baked in. Right? I mean, everybody had anticipated this being approved. Um, so it is one of those things where, and that is an old saying in the industry, right? Is that you, you should sell on the news, right? And you buy on the on the on the rumors and sell on the news. And I think everybody anticipated that coming. Um, it did give the the Bitcoin a little bit of a pop. All cryptocurrencies had a nice little pop towards the end of the week. Um, again, pretty volatile. Not something that we really recommend or trade in much. We know we have some clients and some individuals that that have a little bit of it, and it's it's the same story as always, right? If you want to do some, do it on your own. I wouldn't really, if, from a financial advising standpoint, it's really hard to dive in and say, yeah, we recommend this or don't recommend this for any financial advisor out there, right? Yeah. By the way, I, I think you know I know CNBC reported. I wonder if it was the SEC's X account themselves, and in fact. I saw something. I don't know if it was Elon Musk or, or uh, Twitter slash X. We'll just call him X for simplicity because that's the name now. I think they said that they didn't have two-factor authentication turned on. So I don't know if that's true or not. But literally, you know, they're they're saying, well, the SEC didn't didn't have their. If they had two-factor, it wouldn't have been able to be hacked or whatever it is. So I don't know. But yeah, Bit, Bitcoin is. They have these ETFs. Apparently, they're going to hold actual Bitcoin, and it's not like GLD where they have a vault with you know, gold bars or anything like that. But I don't know. I mean, it, it's people who have been listening for a long time know my opinion on Bitcoin, and it's I'm a little bit of a skeptic still. But all right, so let me move on to the market, though, Mike. And you know, something you and I watch is valuations. And there was a, a chart, I think Charlie uh, Bellello put this out. And what he did was he showed S&P earnings growth, price returns, and trailing 12-month P.E. ratios. So what he did was he said, did the trailing P.E. expand or contract? And what this means is, let's say that you had, I don't know, earnings on the S&P of $200. You know, they're more than that. But for easy sake, uh, I'll say 200 Well, if the market's trading at 10 times earnings... 10 times 200, it's 2,000. If it's 15 times earnings, it's 3,000. If it's 20 times earnings, it's 4,000. Um, I have a little bit of a, a challenge with this data. It's it's not that I, I think it's wrong. It's just the market is forward-looking. So to use a, a, a PE multiple expansion, meaning what's the PE? Did it grow? Or did it decline? Against trailing, I don't think it's the best use of data. Really, you want the forward but his points well taken. And Mike, you know, I think we've seen the forward multiples increase. I know you've been looking at some data from uh, JP Morgan's guide to the market. And, you know, 2022, the decline, it was a decline in multiple, not a decline in earnings. And now we've had the multiple sort of reflate, you know, and I know you've been looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have. I, I think one of the one of my talking points for for next week. Um, and and when the chart that I'm looking at today, for those of you who can't see it, is that the the market's really done nothing over a two year period, right? If we look to January third, twenty twenty two, to December thirty first, twenty twenty three, the S P was at forty seven ninety seven, and now it's at forty seven seventy, or at least it ended last year there. So really, I mean, slightly down, not much. But when you look at the PEs, right? And I think Derek, correct me if I'm wrong here. This is the four PE of twenty one point four. Uh, in in January of 2022 right. versus yeah versus today, uh, which is 19.5. So PEs have actually slightly come down, um, and you know I, I, a lot of, a lot of people and a lot of investors look at that as a, as a kind of a buying signal, right? With lower PE ratios, I think you hear that a lot on the street. 
Um, dividends are slightly up. And then the the 10-year treasury, that's that's the big mover there, right? We go from 1.6 in Jan 22 to 3.9 in December 23. So um, and, and that's been bad for bonds. I mean, we all know that the bond portfolios have gotten hit pretty hard over the past few years. Maybe they got a little spike when uh, the Fed said that they were done raising interest rates. But for the most part, I mean, you know, the market, P.E. ratios, dividends, you know, other than bonds going down, I think a lot of this stuff just really hasn't moved much. Yeah, I mean, I, it, on, a, on a two-year basis, now granted, people are still getting dividends and, you know, those are total returns. But certainly, and, I, and you know, you and I have talked about this offline, it's sort of a hated recovery. And, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of people, you know, the market was up over 20, I mean, what, close to 25% total return basis last year. But if you talk to people, they're like, eh, it's doing okay, you know? So maybe it's that scarring or that memory from 2022 or remembering, you know, the, the markets have not, in, in, on a cyclical basis, the markets haven't, you know, until well, we're almost at a, at a new high, right? Uh, a new all-time high. We almost got there today. Uh, we kind of hit the, see the law of, of round numbers, hit 4,800 and then bounce back down. But I think that's part of it. It's it just, you know, just like technical analysis, uh, uh, you know, people trading on technicals will say the market has a memory. I think people have a memory too. And it's, and your point's taken where over a two-year period, you're sort of back where you were, but you had some pain on the way. Yeah, yeah, you definitely had some pain on the way. That's a great way to describe it, right? We 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 haven't really gone anywhere. And for advisors working with clients, you know, talking to their clients and their clients feeling uncomfortable over the past two years of hey, the market's dropping and and I don't feel good. And and they're right, the market dropped twenty five percent, right? Peak to trough. We I think we ended up um, twenty twenty two down about eighteen percent. So, um, but but that twenty five percent number is pretty negative. A lot of people didn't feel good. That's when hedging starts to make sense, right? Those hedges kick in and, and can help protect the portfolio. Um, but this rebound that we experienced last year, sure, it felt good, but your clients aren't any better than where they were uh, two years ago, right? So you're, you know, if you had $100,000 or a million dollars in an account today, you, you got maybe close to $100,000 or, or maybe a million bucks in that account uh, and that second account today, right? There's been a lot of pain the past two years, not a lot of growth in the market overall, um, so, th you know, and, and like you said, is this correction hasn't felt good. I mean, or, or I don't think people have felt really good through this market, but, um, we're, we're flat to where we were, you know, we could head up from here if we can break through that level that that 4,800 level. Yeah. I mean, it's, you mentioned the hedging. I mean, that's part of why we, we don't try and pick markets, you know, you sort of buy and hedge. The core thing we do is buy and hedge. We do a lot of other things, but I, I will say this. I mean, I think people have been overly pessimistic in hindsight on the economy. And, and I've made mention of coming into 2023, 29 out of 30 polled economists said we were going to go into a recession. We never did. You know, Mike, one of the the classic sort of recession indicators is, is the yield curve on bonds. And of note, uh, and this doesn't really have any, uh, Cam Harvey, who, who sort of created the the whole yield curve inversion thing. He looks at the 10-year yield and he looks at the three-month yield. And then when the three-month yield is higher than the 10-year yield, he, you know, it's inverted, meaning sh very, very ultra-short rates are higher than, than longer-term rates. Uh, I, it is n of note, though, that the 30-year and the two-year spread went positive again. I don't think there's any necessarily you know, big analytical, uh, you know, basis looking at 30 and two, it's Cam Harvey was always the, the three month 10, 10 year, which is still inverted, but that's something, I mean, the 30 year bond. And by the way, it should be paying you more than short rates. Cause if you buy a 30 year bond, you're taking risk, you're holding duration. You have much more interest rate sensitivity. So normally you get paid more to go longer out, but you know, Mike looking at, at the 10 year over the three month, uh, it tried to make a run back towards, uh, you know, even, didn't really get close. We're still more than 100 points, 100 basis points inverted. It, it's a long time that it's been inverted. I don't know that it's been the longest, but as a recession indicator so far, 
hasn't happened yet, although many people point out that the recession happens right after it uninverts. When that happens, you know, anybody's guess. Uh, but yeah, I look at this, Mike, and I it's just been one of those things where everyone has pointed to saying recession, recession, recession. Well, at least the 30 and the two year uninverted. That's something, I guess, right? Right. And I think a lot of people talk about the yield curves. Um, a lot of the bond buyers out there, right, have been, you know, some people I think are pretty happy about the, the you know, they can now get some decent bonds. I think They're, you've probably seen that out in the market, right, where people are, you know, excited to get higher yields or you've talked to those investors that are happy to get these CD rates that are advertised. And, and remember, advisors, right, these are advertised rates, from some of these banks or these online banks. They're not exactly, uh, the, the client doesn't usually get those or an individual doesn't usually get those rates when they call in. Um, but, you know, so some people have, have, you know, there's some people that are negative on this and there's some people that are positive, right? I think the interesting thing that is the two year, right? I'm looking right now, it's four, 4.1 on the, on the two year versus what the 30 year, or it's about flat, right? The 10 year is about 3.9. And the uh, the thirty years about four point two. So um, yeah, the shorter end of the curve is is yielding a lot better, Derek. I mean, I'm looking at six months here at five percent. I mean, why buy a thirty year bond at four when I can when I can get five percent on a six month? I mean, the reason somebody would buy, and we're not saying to buy, or I mean, if you want to buy thirty year bonds, buy them. If you don't want to buy them, don't buy them. But the the reason why somebody would go out and take duration is that there's the belief that the thirty year yield would drop meaning rates go down, bonds go up. So someone buying that just for you know a, a cash flow would say, hey, I think rates are going to be here or lower over the next 30 years, and I'm happy with that little over 4% annual yield. And if and the other side would be, okay, I think I think rates are going to go down, so bonds will go up. So it's an interest rate play. You know, that's, a, that's an entirely different thing. But I, here's the good thing, though. I mean, higher rates, there, there's pain, especially if people are in bonds. And we, we've been talking about bonds for a long time. I wrote in my book about the problem with low rates in bonds and the sensitivity to interest rates and the risk to the upside. But the good thing is there are plenty of people who just had cash earning nothing, zero. And now they can actually go out and, you know, for cash, you have a substitute. You can get, as you said, a six-month uh, you know, treasury bill is is yielding over five percent right now. So, of course, inflation's been higher, but you know, still, it's it's good for people to get a little bit of yield on their cash for sure. The one other thing I was going to mention is that you know this is normal, right? Like these rates. Like I, I bought a car recently, and I was at the I was a dealership, and, and the finance guy, right? You go in the back and you deal with the finance guy, and he, and he had been doing this for like thirty five years. And he talked about, he's like, look, these rates are normal. He's like, if you buy a car at 6%, that's a normal thing to happen, right? They, for for the first 20 years of this guy's career, he was he was selling cars and doing loans at 6%, right? That, that's a normal rate. We've just been spoiled in the last decade of you know buying cars at 2% or 3% um, and buying houses at 2 or 3% as well. So it, it it might feel like this is a lot higher, but I think this is a normal interest rate environment. And and so something that you and I talk about a lot, Derek, is just because rates are higher doesn't mean the market can't go higher, right? If we look at the '90s when rates were a little bit higher, market went a lot higher during that time frame. So, um, you know, looking at the inverted yield curve or, or higher interest rates, I don't think advisors or individual clients should be scared of this. This is really a normal environment. In some cases, can push the market higher, and it did so in the nineties. There, there's a dynamic to this too, in that many companies they sold bonds. You know, of course, companies raise money. It's one of the ways, ways the companies raise money is they they go out and they issue bonds. It's if you buy a bond, you're essentially loaning your money. When you buy a bond, and you get paid semi annual interest payments, you know, on corporate bonds. But bond yields, uh, many of these companies locked in were much lower. Now, over time, that's going to change. But, you know, it's it's actually been a benefit. And I tell you what, there's a lot of companies too. I, I haven't looked at Apple's cash position, but Apple's usually, you know, quote unquote, famous for having cash. Now they're getting, instead of nothing, they're getting a little bit of, uh, more than a little bit of a yield. So 
No, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's a normal environment. Uh, I remember in the 19, mid 1990s getting 5% of my checking account. And granted, some of the big banks are still still giving nothing, but yeah, it, it it's good to have a choice, an alternative. As I say, it used to be the Tina trade. There is no alternative. There is an alternative now for sure. All right, let me transition to. I want to talk a little bit about volatility, and so I watch the VIX. I watch the VVIX, and we know that the VIX index itself, which of course is a measure of thirty day volatility. It's you know been around twelve and a half or so today. It's been in and out of there, uh, but one of the things I've been watching as well is the VIX, and I talk about this every week. Uh, Jay and I usually touch on it at least once every podcast. Well, the VIX today was up you know roughly nine nine to ten percent. The VIX, of course, is the volatility on options on the VIX itself. So it's kind of the volatility of the volatility index, if that makes any sense. But if you look, it it had gotten down to as low as, oh, I don't know, you know, 75, 76 or so. And then today back up to right around 85. What that means is that the prices or the premiums that uh, options are available for, either buy or sell on the VIX index, uh, they were really, really low. And we've said before that sometimes low volatility begets more low volatility. And uh, that's some of the things we're seeing as far as the the indications and the indicators that that we watch. But yeah, Mike, I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's of note today, and maybe it's, you know, in front of the three-day weekend, but options on the VIX were, are, a little pricier than they were the last couple of days when they got really cheap. Now, public service announcement, folks, listen up. Get close to the, I was going to say, get close to the radio. Like if, if you're, be careful trading VIX options because VIX options are actually not based upon the, the thing you see on the CNBC screen. That's the spot VIX. You can't trade it. There's no products to trade that. Options on VIX are actually based upon the VIX future. So, whole other things there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Mike, one of the things I certainly have been seeing is we have these low volatility regimes. It seemed like uh, we're in one now. And often, you know, the the big misnomer is, hey, when the VIX is low, I should go, you know, buy a bunch of stuff that's going to go up if the VIX goes up, if there's, or if the VIX is high, it's it's time to, it's time to buy. But, you know, our data actually says some different things. But I, it's interesting because um, the market went up last year and volatility was higher, but volatility is really low now. And we're seeing options, at least on protective side, you know, buying puts and things like that is very, very cheap. So I don't know if you want to comment on it, any of that, but I usually like to touch on the VIX and the VIX and just some interesting things we're seeing in, in the volatility markets. Yeah, I, I you know, volatility was rather low and kind of decreasing throughout the year. We did have a spike in October, right, when we had that pullback in the market. S&P pulled back 10. Um, uh, NASDAQ pulled back 15. And I want to note something here. That is a very normal pullback, right? The, the, the S&P 500 pulling back anywhere from 10 to 14%, that should happen once a year. Uh, Derek, if I pull up this chart here that I was looking at earlier, and I may have um, I may have shared with you, you know, eh, here we go, perfect. the The S and P five hundred pulls back, you know, an average of fourteen point two percent annually, right? So, and then I think this is what clients and, and advisors should should talk about and think about here is when the market pulls back fourteen percent and volatility goes up. That's a that's very normal, right? That that should happen, and it's like shaking the tree, right? The weak fruit falls from the tree, and the stronger fruit, the longer term investors, the people that understand the market, are going to profit from those situations. Um, you know, we had a ten percent pullback last year in October. Market still ended up twenty four percent on the year, big year for the S and P five hundred. So, you know, lower volatility. I think as we started off this year, we saw volatility even go slightly lower. Um, to your side is the the you know the what would it be I guess call skew is in favor Derek is that how you would say it uh, and and puts are very cheap so um, 
you know, I think this is a great time to hedge your portfolio. And I think this is a great time for a lot of stuff that we're doing at Zega is, is you know, hedging your portfolio when things are cheap um, makes a lot of sense because when things get expensive and volatility expands uh, and the market drops, well, guess what? At that point, hedging your portfolio gets very, very expensive. So you do want to hedge when things are cheap and then you want to take advantage of that it, when volatility spikes and you get downward moves. So a little bit spike here towards the end of the week. I know yesterday was a big day or bigger day for, for volatility and a downward drop in the market. Um, but I think right now is the fear index, and I don't know if you have uh, information on this, but from, from what I've been hearing is the fear index is pretty low, which means people feel comfortable and the market's going to go higher. Um, but that that means volatility is low as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's the fear and greed index. Uh, I mean Google Ad, you can CNN has a as a graph they show, and right now it's in it's in greed, and it doesn't mean that the market's necessarily going to go down or or go up or anything. What they do is they look at market momentum, they look at stock price strength, they look at the breadth of uh, of the market. That's just of all the stocks, is everything going up or is it only a few, that type of thing? Put call ratios. And we actually look at a put call ratio that's a little bit different than the one that you even see on here. But yeah, it's it's the idea that when sort of volatility is low and things like, you know, interest rate spreads on on high yield bonds versus versus treasuries, those types of things. But, you know, one, I want to go back to that that graph. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up. This is what since 1980 the average intra-year intra-year drop of 14.2 percent, and it looks like you know I go back and and I won't put you on the spot because I know I know the answer. But if I had a room full of investors, I would and who remember 1987, I would say, remember 1987? They'd say, yeah, 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 remember that? That was really really bad. It was. It was. In fact, the market pulled back that year to minus 34%. And then if I ask people, how bad did the market get? Like, do you remember how bad it, it closed for the year? And, you know, people would probably give me ranges of, oh, it was down 50%, down 20%, down 30%. It, the market closed up 2% that year. Right. Like, despite the 87 crash, the worst couple day crash, the market actually closed up 2%. You look at, um, you know, 2020, down 34%, which I noted at the time was exactly the same pullback as 1987, up 16%. Now, last year, it got as bad as minus 25% and then closed down 19%. And so, you know, but this year, uh, no, sorry, that was, that, was, uh, that was 21. 2023, down 10%, closed up 24%. Like to your point, Mike, we should expect 10% declines. It's a normal correction. Like that's just normal. And, you know, if that's, that's one of the reasons why I think sometimes, and, and I like the people on CNBC, we've been on CNBC. Like I would say a lot of people should not watch the markets like they do. Because if they always get worried about a 10% drop or, you know, and if, and if you're in the market and you're working with somebody and, you know, of course, the portfolio should be set up based upon what you need, what you want, what your risk tolerance is. You know, if you're worried about a 10% decline, there, there's other things for you. But like, I'm glad you brought this up because it happens, like expect it. And over time, markets go up. I don't know if you like my 1987 example, but I've used that when I used to go out and talk to groups and no one ever said the market was up that year. Nobody did. Well, I think you're, you you bring up a great year, 1987, right? I mean, I was uh, I wasn't looking at the markets then. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but right, market pulled back 34 percent. S and P ends up two percent positive too, right? That's 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 a 36 percent swing in one year. Go to go to COVID, right? 2020 markets also dropped 34 percent, and we ended positive 16 percent. So. You know, even in these big years, now 2008 is different, right? We had a negative 49 ending with a positive 30, or excuse me, ending with a negative 38. So negative 49 with a negative 38. That's a big one. And dot com also is a is a big one where you had three big down years in a row, and you had three negative years in a row where the market ended negative. But 
you know, it just shows even during some of these big pullback years, the market can rebound. I, I, I think one of the – yeah, one of the stats here is 33 out of 44 years – so 75% of the time, the market actually ended higher, even though it experienced this 14.2% pullback. So for advisors out there talking to clients that that got nervous in October or they get nervous about the 10% pullback, those are normal, very, very normal. They happen every year. You should expect it to happen. And, and a lot of times it turns out to be a buying opportunity. I tell you what, Mike, my first full year in the markets was 1994. And- I remember talking to investors who had sort of the the memory of 1987 and a lot of people stayed in cash. I probably talked about this before on the show if I, you know, but it's, it's worth repeating. Like people's memory sometimes gets in the way. And I remember talking to people and they said, well, you know, 87 and, and it, you know, that could happen again. I think we're headed for another 87 type crash. You know, when you look at the markets, and you look at 87 on, or even, you know, 94, 95 on, 95 through March of 2000 was one of the best runs the markets have ever had. I mean, you're talking like plus 34, plus 20, plus 31, plus 27. I mean, who knows what the market's going to do going forward. But yeah, I mean, and, and even 2008 is probably a little more your time period where you remember that, you know, people were scarred in 2008 and to, people forget too, in 2009, the market was down another 28% at one point and then wind up closing up plus 23%. So sometimes it can be hard to, to stick with markets, especially for people who have longer time horizons. I will say this too, Mike, for younger investors and every, you know, everyone who's not a younger investor, sort of earmuffs right now, put your hands over your ears. Like you actually want the markets to go down because you're accumulating shares. Like you're reinvesting every every time you get paid in your 401k, you're going into the market. Like you actually don't want the market to just keep making new highs. It's just a weird thing, but you know, it's it's tough to root for. Right. Well, that's where they talk about dollar cost averaging and things like that, right? Is when you that's really where that's the only time that dollar cost averaging makes sense is when markets actually decline a little bit, you get in at cheaper prices. Or if you're a, right, a younger person adding to a 401k and you get to put you know a couple hundred bucks in at a lower price, uh, or you're on a dividend reinvest, right? If you if you know if you have some dividend stocks or some of some of the ETFs that pay high dividends and they you know they distribute those dividends, you want to get more shares at a lower price. So you know either way, market's going up, market's going down. You know I think you should be. Um, you know, I think you should be a long term over uh, what what this data tells us, regardless of what I think, what this data tells us is that the market goes higher over time. So, you know, those big pullbacks sometimes can be buying opportunities. All right. I want to talk about, you know, we, we've all the talk about, you know, the the Magnificent Seven and the weighting of the the big companies in the S&P 500 index. Or I'm talking Apple, NVIDIA, Tesla. Uh, Microsoft. Who am I missing there? Meta. There's someone else. Oh, there's seven of them. And I just named. I can't remember them all. Anyway, yeah, everyone so knows Apple, what they are. Apple, so uh, Google, Google Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, Tesla, and Nvidia. All right, there you go. Thank you, Mike. So, a lot of talk about how the market's very top heavy, but those are growthier companies, and it kind of leads to something that that you've been watching. I got to be honest with you, if you're a value investor and you're looking at data and you're looking at relative PEs and you're looking at a Schiller PE and you're saying on a relative basis, like, why isn't value outperforming growth? And I, I mean, one of the theories is these companies are different and these companies are actually, you know, a lot of the businesses, look at Amazon, they have a cloud business, they have a consumer grocery business, they've got uh, you know, a home delivery, you know, sort of. So, but they, they've they stayed, their margins have stayed high for very long, longer than anybody expected. And I don't know what these companies are going to do going forward, but, you know, their margins have stayed really good. They've They've kept growing and they have a lot of different businesses. But I kind of feel bad for the pure value investor or the value manager who says, at some point, like, when do we have our day in the sun? Like, our stuff is cheap. And they look at, on a relative basis, they look at, we talked about PE ratios, the value segment 
the PEs are much lower than the growthier stuff, you know, the Magnificent Seven stuff. But it's it's been hard for them because, I mean, Mike, we've seen a long period of underperformance relative, not bad performance, just underperformance relative to growth. So I don't know. I mean, beginning of last year, I remember you thought, hey, maybe this is the year where value has its day. No, no, it's the Magnificent Seven, Mike. Right. Yes. And and I did. So if you go listen to one of our old podcasts from early 2023, I talked about value and growth quite a quite a bit. You know, I talked about the valuations and how they how they look compared to each other. And and what I can tell you is that the value investors, myself included for last year's comments, are eating are eating our words. We're eating humble pie at this point. Um, because anybody that really took a heavy uh, tilt towards value underperformed last year. Um, what I can tell you is the data here is the data, and it still says that value is cheap compared to growth. Um, I think there's a, a number of different factors of why it's it's not performing as well. And, and one is that, you know, I think that there's been a lot of questions about the economy and what happens is people tend to go towards large, you know, um, mega cap companies that, uh, you know, are multinational revenue, right? You know, if you think of Apple and, and Amazon and a couple of the, and a bunch of these companies, right? Tesla, right? They sell, Tesla sells cars all over the world, right? NVIDIA sells chips all over the world, right? So these large U.S. companies that derive income from multiple places um, really are, are starting to become almost safe havens for investors. Now, it doesn't mean they can't drop 30%, 40% like they did a couple of years ago because the tech market really did have a major pullback in 2022. But I, I think that's where it is. The mega cap has been really leading the way, and that's made up of tech stocks currently. Yeah, I mean, they're – it's sort of different now too. And when you look at these technological revolutions, and I always go back to uh, Carlotta Perez's book, uh, Technical Revolutions of the, uh, I think it's of the 20th century. Oh, it's somewhere on my bookshelf. But Carlotta Perez basically has these these major inflection points. And for example, the the internet in, in 2000, late 90s, was an inflection point. But one of the theories was, and, and you look at all these different technological explosions, whether it's railroads or, or the, the steam engine or any, any number of things, they, there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of entrance, and there's a lot of booms and bust. And then when the dust settles, you have whoever wins remains. And I think if you look at March of 2000, you could say, well, it's the companies that remain, you know, there are ones that aren't in business anymore. But the standards get set, but it's the older line, the value companies who then reap the benefits of this new technology. And often they have this, this window where they really do well. I don't know. I mean, you could make the argument, so our old line chemical companies or very old banks, will they use AI and that will sort of give them a boost, a, a technical revolution that they'll get to you know, have some, some window that sales? I don't know. But you know, these particular companies, the growth, you know, when they're value, you're sort of competing against growth. The growth companies have just been growthy for so long and the margins have remained high for so long. Sort of the reversion to the mean or that that's new period for value just hasn't happened. But that's one of the theories, Mike, you know, you get these technologies and they get to reap the, the rewards of it. Like Domino's Pizza is a great example. They're a pizza company. But really, they're a logistics company. And then they leverage technology because they have the app. And then they own the data on the app. And they market to everybody who has the app. And they use technology to sort of uh, plan their routes and, and things like that. So as a New Yorker, former New Yorker, you know, North, Northeast New York area, the pizza's not great. I'm just going to be honest with you, all right? But that's, that's sort of one of the theories Carletta Perez would, would put forward. But it hasn't happened. Yeah, well, you're right about that, right? Like the value companies catch up, like the Dominoes, and uh, like the AT and T's, and and you know companies that really work in the consumer space, right? That maybe geared more towards value do better. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking here at a chart um, as well, which is the ten year Treasury uh, rate range and what happens growth versus value. And, and what I can say when you're in the lower interest rate environment. 
what it, what the chart's saying is that growth really outperforms value, right? I'm looking at you know zero to two percent interest rates, and you're looking at fifteen percent in growth and eleven percent on value. Even ticked up a little bit, two to three percent in interest rates. Growth is you know has nineteen percent performance, while while the value is about ten percent. And so, if you think about that, that's right. At lower interest rates, people can borrow money cheaper. So those growth oriented companies don't really pay a lot of dividends. They're more focused on on overall growth, right? They can borrow money cheap to work with R and D uh, and expand their company, right? That re- and so. I think what what this is showing is as interest rates go higher, three to four, four to five, five plus, you start to see value outperform uh, because, again, those growth companies can't borrow money so cheap. The value companies kind of dig their heels in, right? They they got that reoccurring revenue from customers and their their steady cash flows and things like that. So that could be the case. It hasn't, right? That did not happen in 2023. Um, growth majorly outperformed. I mean, if you look at the top uh, quadrant, if I look at a, a style box, you know, the growth stocks last year did 42.7% large cap growth companies versus value doing 11.5, a, a blend of 26. So I, I, it's, it's last year was the year where growth performed well as they rose interest rates, right? If you, if you think about um, what happened, you know, interest rates started the year around four and kind of ticked up into five percent throughout the year. So, if value is going to have its day, and this is, and I'm, I'm laughing because value investors say this every year. This is my year. This is the year where, where value companies are going to do well. Everything is tilted in their favor, right? Their stocks are cheap. Interest rates are where they need to be for them to outperform growth. Is it the year? I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, if I just pull some quick data on, uh, on the value and growth year to date, but hang on, my computer's running a little slow, but I do think value slightly outperforming growth. Uh, you know, it's what we're, we're 11, 12 days in. So I don't know if that's an indicator for the rest of the year, but large cap value is slightly perform outperforming large cap growth, you know, over the past 11 days. So we'll see if it's their year. Yeah. We'll let you know in a year. So <laughs> Of course, you know, Mike and I are just, as I always say, I mean, our, our main thing we do, we buy, uh, in fact, we buy and hedge, you know, we put on portfolios and hedge. We, this is why we make fun of predictions and even the ones that we make, because they're tough to make. So uh, who knows what's going to happen? We're not saying to buy value. We're not selling to sell growth. Can I tell you, the, as I'm looking at, uh, and the audience can't see this graph, but you've got these these different ranges of, of interest rates. And, you know, in the past... You're right. I mean, companies uh, that were more value oriented had better rates to to borrow money at. But if I'm going to play the contrarian here, I'm going to say, who's going to not lend money to Apple or Microsoft or Google? Good point. Like, they, I can't believe, you know, like if you look at those companies versus a bank right now or versus an industrial chemical company that doesn't have as high margins. Like, it's just, I don't know. Like, maybe it's different. Maybe this time is different. And like Apple could probably borrow money cheaper than anybody else, any other company. I don't know that for sure. I'm making that up. I haven't researched it, but I don't know. We'll see. All right. So, Mike, as you remember, usually uh, uh, we do some some recommendations um, at the end of it. And by the way, where somebody asked me where this came from. And I used to listen to Barry Ritholtz had a show on uh, uh, Bloomberg and it was also a podcast. And he would ask somebody, the guest at the end, what are they reading, watching and that stuff. So that's kind of where I took this from. But somebody asked me. Uh, so Mike, I'll, I'll, since I mentioned it, I'll just uh, technological, technological revolutions in financial capital, Carlotta Perez, and the, the book basically goes, at this point, it was, it was written a little while ago, but it's through five major uh, technological revolutions, industrial re- revolution, age of steam, age of steel and electricity, uh, age of oil, automobiles, mass production, and then information. And it's this whole thing is you have these eruptions and technological advances. Uh, the standard, there's a frenzy, the standards are set, there's a turning point. And then you deploy all this new technology, then everybody sort of benefits from it. So it's an academic type book, but uh, it's one I've mentioned before. 
Uh, Mike, before I give you my, uh, I got a movie recommendation on Netflix, but anything you have? Well, if we're, if we're going to hit books for a second, I will, I will tell you uh, Tools for Titans is something that I'm reading. Uh, it is a kind of a longer book, and you kind of read it in sections. It's by Tim Ferriss, and he just goes out and interviews all sorts of people on all sorts of different topics, whether it's health, finance, family, uh, you know, big purchases, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things that you, you might experience through your life. And, and you don't read the book all at once. You kind of read it in sections. And if you want to focus on health, you read the health part. If you want to focus on finances or travel or, or just well-being, you know, there's all sorts of sections in there. So Tim Ferriss, Tools of Titans, it is a great book. Uh, I've had it for a long time, and I went back to a couple different areas recently, and it's been, uh, it's been good to reread some of that stuff. All right. Now, that's, that's a good one. I'll, I'll write that one down. Um, this one, Mike, I think is right up your alley because you you uh, you like to do some adventure stuff. Society of the Snow. It's a it's a movie on Netflix, and it's based upon in 1972 a rugby team from Uruguay. So Uruguay or Uruguay? Uh, I'll call it Uruguay. Uh, send me emails if I've got that wrong. Derek Moore at ZegaFinancial dot com. But they they were flying to Santiago, Chile. And their plane went down in the middle of like these huge mountains and they got stuck there. And it's just, it's the, there's been another movie. It was called alive. I think in 1993 or 94 that, that had come out about this. And this one was way better. It's actually uh it was from Spain, but a lot of the, they do the, uh, the English, you know, overdub on it, but it's not noticeable. And there's a lot of narration in it, but it's pretty compelling about how they survived out there with no, no food, no water, eventually had to sort of figure out where they were going to march out. Um, you know, it's right up your alley though, Mike. I think, I think you'd like this <laughs> sort of a, an adventure. So it's funny you mentioned that. You're the second person to mention that movie to me. And to make it even just weirder overall is I am headed to Chile uh, in two months. <laughs> so it's, 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 and I'm actually going to be on that same flight most likely, or a flight around that area in going over the Andes, which I believe is the mountain range in that area. So you're the second person to mention it. I'll probably wait till after I come back from vacation to, <laughs> to watch that movie. Uh, but I've heard it's really good and I heard it, it tells a really good story and there's a lot of, uh, big decisions that have to be made along the way on how, on how to survive. And so that stuff's always really neat. Um, I will give a, a recommendation yeah. I, uh, before – anything more on that movie, Society of the Snow, before we move on? <laughs> no, just just watch it. I'm, like, I'm pounding the table on it. It's a strong buy from me. OK, a strong buy. All right, I will watch it. The, but, the it, strong- it but I think you hinted to it. It does have some, some decisions to make about how they're going to feed themselves. I'll leave it at that. And they uh, – so it's it's – I, I, it's probably R-rated, you know, just take that under advisement. So anyway. Sure, sure. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll end there. I, I got I got. I may have a good show recommendation for you coming up. I just started up first. I'll, I'll wait I'll wait and save it for the next podcast that I'm on. I, I got a good show recommendation coming in the oh, future. Oh, tease it. Yeah, that's right. We'll <laughs> leave a teaser. All right. <laughs> nice. All right, Mike. Well, listen, thanks for coming on again. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, well, I, we'll definitely have you back on sooner than than the last time. But uh, thanks for filling in this week. Always good. And you, br- you brought a little different perspective. So that's good. So, uh, Absolutely. All right, Mike. Thanks for coming on. And for everyone else, we'll talk to you again next week. See ya.